Broadcasting. Ah, okay. Yeah, got it. Cool. I think we're ready. We're ready to go. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pablo Mendoza. I'm a professor at the Department of Civil Engineering uh, I, at the Universidad de Chile. I want to welcome you to our Water Resources and Environment webinar series. Today, we have the honor of having with us uh, the Dr. Rodrigo Paiva. Rodrigo is a hydrology professor at the Institute for Hydraulic Research from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil since 2014. Rodrigo Paiva develops research and teaching on simulation models and satellite observations of the water cycle and the hydrology of uh, South America and the Amazon region in the context of environmental changes and water resources management. So today, Rodrigo is gonna be talking about his work doing hydrology in South America from a modeling and satellite observations perspective. So Rodrigo, Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and the stage is all yours. Great, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Pablo, Nico and Karina for inviting me uh, to talk about uh, my work and the work from my colleagues. Um, so thank you for this. Uh, opportunity and um, uh, the talk uh, I'm giving today is the hydrology of uh, South America from a modeling and satellite observations uh, perspective. This work uh, was uh, done uh, by myself and several collaborators from the Institute of Hydraulic Research from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. We have this group called uh, Hydrology, uh, Large Scale Hydrology. And um, part of this work was were, uh, funded by the Brazilian National Water uh, Agency, uh, ANA, Agencia Nacional de Aguas e Saneamento Básico. So the first thing is, uh, why do you want to study South America hydrology? And why should we do it from a large scale hydrology perspective? So um, the, the uh, South America has really large rivers and a diverse set of, uh, climates, biomes, landscapes, cultures, and it's the home of large basins and uh, water issues that are shared by several neighborhood countries, states, and cities. So this figure shows a little bit on that. We have uh, the Amazon with large uh, uh, wetlands. We have the Andes regions. We have uh, uh, arid regions, humid regions. We have rivers with very different uh, uh, hydrological regimes, as for example, this one is very predictable, and another as the Uruguay River that has totally different uh, behavior. And uh, besides that, uh, South America is the home of important aquatic systems. For example, we have the Amazon and the Pantanal. Uh, as I told you, uh, a large and diverse set of rivers, floodplains, and wetlands. It is responsible for around 30% uh, of total global flash water flowing into the oceans. Uh, is the home of a, a, a global land biodiversity and a major player in global climate system and the water, energy, and carbon, carbon cycles. Also, uh, it's a unique continent as it has 
massive river and natural uh, wetlands. And uh, let me just try to... Uh, And um, as you can see here in this map, we have the Amazon wetlands, Pantanal wetlands, massive wetlands over the La Plata. But also we have uh, other places uh, in the continent that are more vulnerable to flood hazards. Uh, in the case of Brazil, most of the people are not, do not live in the Amazon. They live in this uh, Southeast part of Brazil and uh, in these places, especially over small rivers, is, is where we have most of the most of the flood hazard issues. In in, in this re region, we also have a, a growing system of uh, hydropower reservoirs. All these points here are uh, hydropower uh, uh, plants that rely on the water resources for producing most of the energy. In Brazil and in other parts in, in, in all the other continents, or other countries. And we have a growing uh, deforestation and then use changes in irrigation that may change uh, our water resources uh, conditions in the region. So we have lots of issues to study in this uh, region. And um, I work for uh, uh, the Institute of uh, Hydraulic Research in a research group called Large Scale Hydrology. And we deal with the hydrology of large rivers. We typically try to understand hydrological processes of large basins. We basically use uh, numerical models uh, for doing these studies and satellite observations and try to uh, quantify hydrological uh, fluxes, uh, storages, and processes across this region, and to provide information for several applications, for example, flood hazard or draw uh, management, environmental, uh, the energy sector, and so on. This is a picture of our uh, group in a past uh, Brazilian symposium. And uh, the group is led by myself and other colleagues, Walter Colichon, Wanderson, Hoff, and Ferdinand Lufan. You can check in this, uh, in this uh, website some of our activities. And uh, from, from a few years ago, we, we decided to uh, move from large basins to a continental scale of analysis. So we, we started this same water initiative which is South American Water Resources Initiative. Um, this, this is more like an agenda of our research group. And uh, we, with this initiative, we developed the hydrological models and satellite observations to study the region, to create things as hydrological analysis, flood forecast systems, uh, understand water uses and hydrological processes, understanding past conditions, present and future conditions, what could happen in the next week or in the next uh, decades. And uh, how, how, how can we do this analysis? As I told you, the first, uh, the first set of tools relates to uh, hydrological models. We develop uh, and use this model that we call Modelo de Grandes Bacias, MGB uh, in Portuguese, which stands for Large, large Scale Hydrological Model. It's basically a process based hydrological model that simulates uh, the different uh, hydrological processes in a basin using physical based uh, equations. For example, evapotranspiration, uh, water in the soil or in the uh, groundwater. And it, and it also accounts for uh, uh, river hydrodynamics. So how flood waves propagates along the river network. 
So we use a special, uh, a special model, detailed model for that. It is distributed at large scale, as I said, you can produce results over a, a large river network. It, it, it was used already for a diverse set of applications and it became popular in Brazil. So uh, it was applied in several basins in Brazil, South America, and also other continents as Africa and even the United States. And um, it has some things like a, a, a graphic interface like this. And um, it was used in basins and in South America like this, as I'll uh, show you. And um, we moved the application of this model for the whole South America uh, domain in this work by Vinicius Siqueira. Uh, Pablo knows him. And um, this, this figure shows some examples of hydrographs generated in different points across the continent. And uh, we, we did several validations of this model. What, what you can see here is in black, observed discharge in in situ going stations, and in red, the simulations. So you, you can see that the model can replicate both seasonal hydrographs from the Amazon, but also places as in Uruguay, where we have very flashy floods, and uh, the same thing for other parts of the continent. We noted that uh, while applying this model at this, this domain, we had an accuracy that is equivalent to local models. And we got significant improvements over global hydrological models. Um, and uh, we attribute this improvement, as you can see here, this in blue is where we got more improvement if compared to global hydrological models. And we attribute this improvement uh, to the fact that this model accounts for hydrological processes that are very relevant for this continent. As for example, uh, the hydrodynamics of large rivers and, and large uh, wetlands. For instance, you can see in these graphics, the results, if we do not account for this process, we can see that in the gray line, and uh, we, uh, in this case, the, the, the result is much poor. And, and this is what typically global hydrological models uh, uh, do. This is how they usually perform. We also use other detailed uh, hydrodynamic model for specific systems as the Amazon. This is one example where you apply the RECRAS 2D model to study the main river hydrodynamics, but also the hydrodynamics of the wetlands, the velocities, the amount of water that uh, flows in the systems and the consequences for the Amazon uh, ecological habitats. And the second, uh, the second branch of tools that we use a lot are the remote sensing. This figure is from this review paper uh, called Hydro uh, Amazon Hydrology from Space, Scientific Advances and Future Challenges. Uh, but it, this is valid for the, the whole South America domain. The fact is that uh, uh, since last decades, there were a great advance in the number of satellite missions focused on the monitoring the, the hydrological cycle. For example, we have several satellites that can measure uh, precipitation using active and passive microwave sensors or uh, uh, infrared sensors. We have several missions that can, for example, uh, measure the water uh, surface elevation of rivers and lakes. So several altimetric missions like the Jason, Envisat, ISAT. We have missions like the GRACE satellites, the GRACE and the GRACE follow-on that can measure gravity anomalies over uh, the earth. 
and convert that into uh, terrestrial water storage changes over the surface, soil, and groundwater, and so on. And the fact is that as the Amazon and the South America, they have very large rivers with very strong hydrological signals in terms of precipitation, evapotranspiration, and discharge. Uh, it was somehow the ideal laboratory to test all these methods to measure uh, to measure hydrology from space. So you see in the literature lots and lots of research using the Amazon as a test case for developing the, this technology. And now this technology can enable us to build a complete picture of the hydrological cycle in the region and to understand how this region is changing due to uh, climate change or other anthropogenic uh, pressure as deforestation or reservoir uh, hydropower building and so on. Here we have some examples of uh, results using remote sensing to measure the hydrological cycle of the Amazon. For example, uh, by using altimetry satellites, it's possible to create what we call virtual stations, where we have an intersection of the satellite orbit with a river. And we, the virtual station is like a virtual gauging station. At this point, we can measure uh, water levels and we, create, we can create time series like this one. So every point here in the Amazon, we have a, we have a time series with measures every, uh, every month or every 10 days, it depends on the satellite. And uh, the density of these measures are, are much larger than what we can get with uh, in situ observations. With that, with this kind of, of observation, we can really uh, measure several things and understand several things. For example, we can understand what is the amplitudes of the flood wave in different rivers. So here in the Amazon, we have larger amplitude in the Madeira too, lower amplitude here in Tapajós and Xibu. We can understand the timing of the floods and the droughts, understand river flood plain connectivity and the role in the ecological processes and so on. A second example concerns to water color. In these large rivers, we can use satellite imagery from uh, missions as the MODIS that has already a large, a large um, record, large record of observations starting from uh, 2000, year 2000, yeah, 2000. And um, we can select a few bands, for example, infrared or red, that are sensitive to uh, sediment concentration. So this, in this animation, you can see a proxy of sediment concentration in the Amazon River and these tributaries, the Negro, Madeira, and also the, the, in its wetlands. And this map here, shows a synthesis of this uh, long time series where you can produce uh, information concerning which rivers are usually with more sediments. For instance, the, the, the Amazon and the Madeira River and which rivers are poor in sediments, as for example, the Negro. And uh, how it changed over time, for example, in the wetland. We can identify wetlands that are fed by the main river. And we can also identify wetlands like this one that are fed by the tributary. So this kind of, of observation can really help us to understand the hydrodynamics of the system and all the related uh, ecological processes. And uh, a final example concerns the monitoring of evapotranspiration. This work is led by uh, Professor Anderson from our group. And uh, they are uh, using 
moderate and higher resolution satellite imagery as MODIS and LUTSAT to map evapotranspiration over South America and uh, to understand the natural system, but also to monitor water uses by irrigation. Here, what, what you can see is several pivot centrais for, uh, for agricultural uh, irrigation and this kind of technology are now being, uh, uh, been starting to be used by, uh, for, for example, by the, the Brazilian Water Agency, ANA, to regulate water uses in the country. And um, we can, could also use these uh, satellite observations to, to, to improve the hydrological models. So in this slide, we show validations of the continental hydrological model using different satellite observations. For example, water levels from satellite altimetry. So these points are virtual stations of water levels. What we can see in, in blue or green are places where we have good results, as you can see here in this figure. Or we can validate also evapotranspiration from the hydrological model. Here we can, we can see a good fit for La Plata Basin and the Amazon, or even for the water storage variations across different regions. For example, in the Amazon, we can see in red uh, the model and in black observations with good agreement. And here also for the La Plata Basin. So these validations give us more confidence about the model results and uh, about what we can do with that for other applications. And that, that's what I'm going to show you now, how we can apply these methods and what lessons we can learn from this uh, technology. For instance, we can use that to understand past hydrological variability, to understand past floods or past droughts, and um, this is an example for the Amazon region, where, where Isli uh, produced the concept of hydrological reanalysis, which is basically using the hydrological model forced by long-term precipitation data, several decades, and uh, also by using in situ uh, discharge observation to assimilate it into the model to improve uh, the results. And the result, as a result, what we can have is very long time series like this one. The series starts from the beginning of the last century. And with this very long time series everywhere in the basin, we can, for example, understand the specific extreme events as the 2009 flood in the Amazon. We can really build a picture of these events or compare different uh, past floods and droughts. For instance, what we have here in black is the median year and in blue are past uh, floods uh, reported in the literature and in, in red uh, past uh, historical floods. This is a second uh, example. Uh, in this uh, part of South America, we have we had a really extreme flood in the year of 83 that impacted several rivers in South America. And these uh, animations show here the precipitation of this year, and here the, the discharge of the, the rivers. Now in March, then in April, and these colors here, they are not uh, discharge itself. It's not discharging cubic meters per second, but it's in terms of return period. So if you, uh, if you see uh, red uh, colors, it, it means extreme floods. And th this is a synthesis. 
Uh, here we, we can see the, the maximum discharge in terms of return periods in different parts of South America. And we could see that these flaws were not independent. It's like it was really a large scale phenomena that impacted uh, the uh, Uruguay River, Paraná River, uh, parts of San Francisco, Tocantins, Paraguay, and et cetera. We could also use these results to build a picture and understand uh, the natural hydrological regimes of, of the different rivers. So this is uh, the work from Larissa Ribeiro that um, uh, Pablo uh, mentioned uh, when we were uh, chatting prior to this uh, presentation. And um, what Larissa did was to take the time series of all these rivers and calculate a, several hydrological signatures and indicators. So now we can compare, uh, for example, um, different characteristics of the region. Uh, for example, uh, uh, annual precipitation here we can see a region with uh, a dry region in northeast of Brazil or part of Argentina, a wet region in the Amazon, in the south. Here is the climate map, wetland map, or a, a, a groundwater map. And, and here what we have is, for example, the deep flow map. So in blue, we see rivers with lots of discharge relative terms, for instance, south of Brazil, Uruguay, all the Amazon, and rivers with a little amount of discharge as northeast of Brazil and parts of uh, Argentina and Paraguay in the uh, uh, Paraná River Basin. Uh, but we could also uh, produce other indicators as the runoff ratio. What is the percentage of precipitation that turns out to in, uh, that uh, converts into discharge. So uh, uh, blue here means humid uh, regions with uh, humid rivers. The same thing we see here in the Amazon, in southern parts of Brazil, and dry arid regions here, and in this uh, part here. We could also try to understand the flood timing when the flood typically occur in different parts of South America. For instance, in my region here in the south of Brazil, the floods typically occur during our winter around July, uh, August, and um, during uh, spring too. But in other regions, it's different. For example, southern parts of the Amazon, the floods typically occur in the beginning of the year, and so on. So, and um, another interesting in this indicator is how the hydrographs could be. What is the predictability of the, the hydrograph in different parts of South America? In some rivers, what we have is a hydrograph that is repeats in a very similar way every year. This is the case of the Amazon here. But in other regions, what we have is an unpredictable hydrograph. We could have draws any time of the year. We could have floods any time. And it's difficult to know exactly how long the floods or draws will last. And this is the case of southern parts of uh, Brazil. So in this map, when you see red, is our rivers that are not very predictable. So here, uh, in this part of uh, Brazil too, parts of the Chile is the same. And in blue, we have the, in, in green are the rivers that are more uh, predictable uh, every year. And the same kind of model could be used to uh, simulate and understand not only 
water availability, draws and floods, but also uh, water quality. So uh, there are a few uh, efforts to implement uh, water quality and sediment production and transport modules into this model. This is an example of the MGB set model that can calculate erosion from precipitation and it can propagate this amount of soil across the basins and across the rivers. And this is the, the, the synthesis of uh, this simulation. What we can see are some rivers that are rich in sediments. All the rivers here, for instance, that drain the Andes uh, to the Amazon, as the Solimões, the Madeira River. Uh, then this concentration, it decreases uh, down, downstream as, as it receives water that are not so rich in sediments. And, uh, and other rivers has the similar uh, behaviors, okay? And uh, it, it, this kind of information can be used for several applications, as for example, for uh, reservoirs, uh, um, lifetime or for ecological processes and so on. And this kind of model can also be used to understand how the hydrological uh, cycle is changing. So how it changed in the past and how it can change in future. This figure shows, uh, shows a result uh, using now, now it's using observations, not using modeling results. And what we can see for Brazil is, is regions that uh, during the last decades, starting from the 80s to uh, 2015, what was observed was a decrease in low flows, meaning uh, severe draws here in the center part of Brazil and the decrease of floods in the central part of Brazil too, but also increase of floods in the Southern part of Brazil and also in the Amazon region. And the authors, the main author is Vinicius Chagas and Pedro Schaff. Uh, they conclude that they attribute these changes to changes in precipitation and evapotranspiration. And they argue that it means that parts of the region can be accelerating because they are having more intense floods and draws, like, like this one. Parts of the region are disaccelerating, like this, this one. Parts of region are just getting dry, drying for both floods and, and draws, uh, for example. Um, this, this is another study that is based on both uh, uh, remote sensing and, and modeling results showing changes in the flooding of the Amazon region. What you can see, uh, uh, the authors basically uh, did trend analysis over a large set of observations from precipitation to water levels, uh, water surface extent, and it's pretty clear that the region is facing an increase in, in water level, increase in precipitation. This is where, what you see here in, in blue, in this figure. And also increase in the flooding. That's what you see in this, uh, in this figure here. So uh, this increase in flooding uh, can cause dramatic change in the ecosystems and the habitats uh, that are found in the Amazon wetlands, because it will change, uh, for example, the connectivity with the river and so on. And uh, now the question is how this change can keep going in the future. So this hydrological model can be used, coupled with climate models, so there is a large amount of work uh, 
in the context of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental uh, Panel for Climate Change, um, producing climate projections for the next decades related to global warming and uh, that are related to increased uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. So in this work from João Paulo Breda, what we did, we took climate projections from 25, uh, 25 global climate models from the semi five uh, uh, semi five uh, uh, results. We accounted for two uh, scenarios. One is more dramatic and another one is moderated. This one is pessimist and more the most, most pessimistic. And we evaluated uh, the difference for the future, for the end of the century, using the MGB model uh, forced with these results. And what we can see is basically uh, projections of decrease in precipitation in these areas that you can see here in, in orange, in both figures. Uh, increase in precipitation in the blue areas and a result, a resulting uh, decrease in average discharge in these red rivers here, an increase in, in, in average discharge in the, in the blue here. So the, the, the main message is that what, what can be expected is a drier north region, in the part of the Amazon, part of central Brazil, part of Chile too, and the wetter southern part of Brazil, uh, Uruguay and Argentina, and part of uh, uh, Peru. The same kind of exercise will repeat, focused on the flood discharge. So this result was published in a recent paper, also from João Paulo Breda. And this, in this case, what we did, we used the regional climate model ETA, coped with four uh, global uh, climate models. And we also used the MGB model to run the, all the simulations. And what you can see here in this uh, figure is um, what is expected for, uh, in terms of change of moderate floods. By moderate floods, we mean floods uh, with uh, 2000, uh, uh, 22 years return period. It means a flood that will occur every, every 20. And uh, here change in frequent floods, the kind of flood that can occur almost uh, every year. And the main message here is that, uh, okay, these projections, what they show are increasing floods in, here in south of Brazil, parts of Uruguay, Argentina, and Paraguay. Also in uh, parts of um, the upper, the upper Amazon Solomon's uh, river basin here in, in Peru. This signal is stronger for the, the frequent floods and it's weaker for the more moderate floods. And also what we can see is that with climate change, uh, the projections are a decrease in flood mag magnitudes in a good part of central Brazil. And, and also, also, for instance, uh, uh, Orinoco Basin. And these patterns may be related to both uh, precipitation, how, how pre intense precipitation can uh, change in future, but also due to soil moisture. As temperature may increase, evapotranspiration may increase, and as a consequence, soil moisture may decrease in this part uh, causing decreases in floods in the region. And uh, one way to adapt to these changes is to, uh, is using uh, monitoring and uh, forecast systems. There are already some efforts on evaluating how this model can be used 
fed by uh, weather forecasts, quanti quantitative precipitation forecasts from, uh, mm. from different centers as EC and WF. And um, these animations show, show you some demonstrations of uh, forecasts for, for different rivers. This is not operational yet for South America, but there are several efforts on evaluating that. For instance, for the Brazilian energy sector, for the hydropower plants, they really need this forecast to know how to operate all operate the reservoirs. And uh, what is already operational is this system that we call SARDIN, which stands for South America River Discharge Monitor. This is basically a monitor that is um, built um, from the hydrological model. It can produce maps like this one show, showing the current states uh, of the South America rivers. So what we do in this system, we basically take uh, precipitation data from a satellite, uh, from, from satellite uh, sensors as the NASA GPM, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. This is a near real-time data. So we, we have a computer that downloads this data every day. This data is used to feed the hydrological model in GB. The discharge produced for this day is compared with the historical discharge uh, time series starting from the 80s. And we do statistical analysis to rate this discharge in terms of uh, the flow duration or uh, return period using a, a typical plot and draw frequency analysis using uh, statistics. And as a result, what we can have is a map like this that has indicators of the, of the current conditions in terms of return period of the draw or the flood or the, the percentile of this discharge compared to, to the past. And uh, you can check this in this website. You can use your computer to do that or you can use your, 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 um, your smartphone to check and, and zoom in the river you have interest. And um, as an example, this, this, this uh, um, picture shows the state we had in 2001, where in Brazil we had this really record draw in central Brazil that caused an important energy crisis. So that's what the draw you see here in these uh, red rivers. And at the same time, we were facing a record flood uh, in the Amazon that caused several floods in several uh, parts and causing damage to local uh, population. Uh, uh, this, now this picture shows the, the, the state of the last uh, two months. Now we have an opposite. We, we, have, um, we had floods in the last months in several parts of Brazil. Santa Catarina, in Acre, in the Amazon, and the, the they were really uh, important uh, floods. And in my uh, region here in southern Brazil, we are facing now an important draw. And the same draw is, uh, is uh, occurring in parts of Uruguay and also parts of uh, Argentina. You could also check what is what is happening now. So this is this is a print of the system for 2005, uh, April 2005. So the, the situation is similar. So I invite you to check for your region uh, what is going on. And um, so I show you different tools, different technologies that could be used to understand and uh, produce uh, information for water resources management in South America. There is still several challenges. For example, concerning climate change, we still need 
to better understand how extreme flaws and draws will change, what would be the impact on water security, uh, how to prepare for climate change or even the natural viability, uh, what will be the role of deforestation in parts of the Amazon, for instance, or the increasing number of reservoirs and irrigation in changing the South America hydrology. These changes are occurring pretty fast and we need uh, methods to evaluate that. And how should we translate these science lessons and technologies, these models and data sets into an easy, easy and valuable information and indicators for water resources decision makers. This is really a, a challenge. Uh, one opportunity that I would like to mention uh, concerning remote sensing is the recent launch of SWAT satellites. SWAT is the surface water ocean topography mission. It's a uh, NASA and uh, uh, French satellite. It was launched in December last uh, year and you, it will soon start providing observations of uh, rivers and lakes all over the world. Um, I could, I would, I, I also would like to talk about some community initiatives for South America hydrology. The first one is the South America Water from Space. This initiative is basically a few meetings that occur every two years. This uh, meeting is being organized by several institutions uh, from uh, South America countries, but also with lots of uh, support from the French Institute of Research and uh, Development. Our last uh, meeting occurred in Foz Iguazu uh, last year. And uh, it typically gather scientists and uh, decision makers that um, want to use uh, satellite information for, for hydrology and water resources management. So uh, I still don't know where the next event will be, but uh, you are all invited. Here you can see the website. A second initiative was this um, workshop held in Florianópolis, uh, Brazil, in uh, February of this year. Uh, this workshop was uh, organized by the International Association of Hydrological Sciences. And uh, the workshop had the objective to enhance the collaboration of Latin American partners for the Latin America hydrology science. There were several participants from the different countries. Uh, Pablo was one of them. He's probably, he's here, Pablo's here. Um, and uh, this meeting had, se have, had several outcomes. One of the outcome was to review and propose unsolved problems in hydrology in South America. So the group uh, discussed and vo voted what were the most important uh, mm -hmm. the problems. And this will be uh, documented in a paper that uh, will be coming soon. The group is also proposing a, a regional uh, Latin America committee uh, in the International um, Association of Hydrological Sciences to promote meetings and everything and activities. And there, uh, there is a proposal of a meeting in Chile uh, next year, a similar meeting to, to discuss these things. And finally, I would like to invite you for the Brazilian uh, Water Resources Symposium that will occur in November this year in Aracaju. It's in the northeast part of Brazil. It's a very beautiful city. Here you can check the website of the event. This is organized by the Brazilian Water Resources Association. 
And for this event, uh, myself, with uh, Pedro Schaff and other colleagues, we proposed this section called New Science for Operational Hydrology in Latin America. So uh, the submissions are uh, open till the end of May. You are all invited to participate and uh, possibly the association can help uh, with traveling for uh, Latin America partners as a, it's, it's possibly uh, uh, far to be here in uh, Aracaju. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your interest in this uh, subject. And um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm available for your questions and discussions. Okay, Rodrigo, uh, thank you very much for such an interesting talk. I, I'm quite impressed of the, uh, the massive amount of work that uh, uh, you and, and your group have put in order to to generate the system right in order that allows to to get a lot of data and also to address uh, lots of questions related to the hydrology of south america and also to provide useful information for decision makers uh, so thanks again and nico i don't know if you have any questions from the audience on youtube yeah, there is a question uh, by Ruben Calvo. So thanks, Ro uh, Ruben, for your question. He says, hi. Thank you, Rod uh, Rodrigo, for the presentation. It's great to see models being developed in our region. And um, here's the question. Uh, you mentioned that MGB estimates are better than global hydro models. Would you explain what, processor, what processes are better represented in MGB? Okay, so uh, in this, uh, can you see my, my screen again? Yes, but not in presentation mode. Okay, I will come back to that slide so I can uh, explain. So uh, in, this, in this work from uh, Vinicius Siqueira, we, we, we did a very uh, strong effort into building this model. This model was built after uh, years of experience building models in different basins in South America. And um, for the, the main process, the main process that uh, we, we put a lot of effort concerns to river hydrodynamics. In South America, we have very large basins with large rivers where the, uh, the transit time of flood waves in the rivers are, are very important. And this process is typically not accounted in global models. So we developed this kind of, um, this kind of special routing scheme uh, for this region. And uh, as another thing is that we, we calibrated the model for the different parts of South America. So we turned, for example, soil parameters for the Amazon or for the Paraná River. And we did that with, with local experience uh, concerning what, is, what are the, the, the processes of the, of the region. And then uh, what we did was, okay, is it really better than global model? So we, we took a few global models from global data sets, uh, three or four, I, I don't remember now. And we calculated several metrics uh, uh, of performance uh, using daily discharge, okay? One of the metrics was, for example, clean Gupta efficiency. This is a typical uh, metric used in hydrology. If clean Gupta is one, the model is perfect. If it's zero, it's really bad. Uh, here, what you can see in this figure is the clean Gupta for the MGB model. You can see that it's, it's, very, it's close to one with several bases. We calculated for the global models and the, the global model, they has lots of biases, uh, timing, differences. 
This is because they don't do much calibration. They, they do not account for this process. Typically, the clean Gupta of these global models are very close to zero or even negative. And as a, as a consequence, if we compare the MGB with the global models, this is the increment we get. So the, the increment uh, in blue, it can be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So with that, we concluded that uh, the, the effort into improving a model for the continental scale, it, it, was, it was useful. Pablo, do you have any questions? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh... Do you have any questions? Oh, yes. Of course. <laughs> Pablo always has questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, Rodrigo, at the very beginning of your presentation, you were mentioning that um, uh, there has been a, a growing system of uh, hydropower reservoirs in the Amazon. And it looks like you have been able to generate, uh, to produce very nice uh, data set for, for several decades. Have you had the chance to? examine how the hydrology in the Amazon River Basin has changed because of this, because of this growing system, how hydrological regimes have been modified? Uh, not, not actually not yet. So if we look, uh, let me find a figure to demonstrate that. Um, in the Amazon, okay, maybe this figure is good. Yeah. In the Amazon, we have some reservoirs in Brazil, Brazilian parts, for instance, the Madeira River, Giral Santo Antonio. They are uh, run, run to the river reserve, uh, hydropower plants. They don't have very big reservoirs. So, so did, they did not change as much the hydrological regime. Uh, some others in small streams, they change it. But the thing is that there are plans to build several other reservoirs in the Amazon. There are several papers discussing that. There are several planned reservoirs in, here in the Peruvian region. And uh, they could change a lot, uh, not only the natural regime, but they could change other things. For example, the connectivity, the river connectivity. This is very important for fisheries. For example, the, the fishes, they, they need to travel across the river network for reproduction and so on. Or for example, if you change the sediment fluxes in rivers, uh, most of the sediments I showed, they, they come from the, here, they, they come from the Andes. So what would happen? If we build several reservoirs here that trap the sediments and the sediments cannot come to the main Amazon River and the flood plains and so on. That, so there are a very important concern related to that. And uh, some paper did some analysis using simplified methods, but I, I think we have room for several, so for several research to coordinate, to help decision makers to coordinate these these future developments. Cool. Uh, thanks, Rodrigo, for the response. Uh, so, speaking of uh, human interventions, uh, does your model, the MGV, consider water withdrawals of any type, or it just uh, simulates a uh, natural hydrology? Okay. the The standard MGB concerns natural hydrology. So if you go into our website and download our code or the interface, you simulate natural hydrology. But as we, this is a research code. It's, a, it's written in Fortran, the core. So several colleagues, they just take it and they, they do modifications. And there are several past research that, that accounted for that. Uh, in uh, more simplified ways or in more complex ways. Okay, thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, I have one more question related to the trend, some trend analysis that you were showing uh, for, mm -hmm. for the drought. 
uh, for drought, I think. At some point, you were showing that the time time series since 1980. Okay, I think uh, it's this one. Yeah, this one? This, this graph, yes. Uh, so, seems like uh, this analysis used data starting in 1980. Is that correct? Yeah, this uh, one starting in 1980. This, uh, this I, I was not... Uh, collaborator in this work. This work is actually from Pedro Schaffi. You, you know him from okay. Annapolis. And um, it, this one is based on in situ observation. Okay. They did uh, statistical analysis using in situ gauges, using uh, some kind of uh, panel regression methods. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, 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 I know where you, I think I know what is your point. Maybe the. This... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I didn't have any specific point about this plot. I was just wondering because you were able to generate a time series starting in in the twentieth century. Oh yeah, so, yeah. I could use from them from the model, right? I could. I could uh... Yes, yes. And I was wondering if you guys uh, have a chance to do some trend analysis with such a because it's a very long data set and you could explain many things in terms of uh, climate variability, for instance. Uh, how yeah, for sure. climate variability or, or, or climate change impact hydrological variables. Have, have you guys gone that far to do this multi we, very long-term uh, analysis? Yes, we did some. For instance, in this uh, is Lee's work, he, mm -hmm evaluated the ability of the model in, in differentiating the wet and the dry years. Mm -hmm. So he did not explore so much trends. It was more focused on uh, checking if the model is able to, to reproduce that. Mm -hmm. Then uh, there is a recent work from uh, Pedro Miranda. It's not published yet. He tried to compare recent trends from FGB to the projections in the future to check if the trends and the climate change projections have the same signal. Uh, and in some regions, it, they, it's coincidence, uh, but in others, it's not. And during this exercise, he, he, he evaluated the capability of the model in detecting trends through. And uh, the answer is, is, is that yes, it's possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's also evaluating the capability of hydrological models into detecting changing flows and draws. And it seems that hydrological models, sometimes they, they can be less sensitive than what they should be. Um, yeah, but it, I mean, it's an ongoing, ongoing work. Um, so I don't have here in detail. Okay, uh, thanks Rodrigo for the, for the response. Uh, so uh, Nicolas has one final question. Yes, uh, and it's about the, yeah, the hydrological reanalysis. Um, you mentioned you were assimilating a stream flow. So my question is, are you planning to assimilate other variables uh, or just a stream flow? Okay, uh, we, we tried already other variables. Uh, uh, also in the context of uh, Isli Correa PhD, he tried, for instance, assimilating uh, future SWOT observations, which, which would be water, water elevation or extent. Uh, during my thesis a few years ago, I also assimilated, I assimilated this kind of, uh, uh, this observation, satellite altimetry, and it worked fine. And, uh, but it would be possible to simulate other like evapotranspiration or soil moisture, as the meteor community is used uh, to do. Uh, the thing is that these assimilation exercises, they are very complicated. They usually use 
complicated mathematical methods with common filters and everything. So um, not not everybody wants to wants to do this kind of uh, uh, hard work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rodrigo. We we have no further questions. I, I want to to thank you again for your time and for accepting our invitation. Okay, so this is how our webinar uh, comes to an end. I want to also thank the audience for getting connected and we will see you in our next webinar. So have a good afternoon, everybody, or a good night if you're in a different time zone like me. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Nico. Thank you, everybody.